Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, it's a good time to create a pollinator garden because everybody's taking out their lawn, right? <laughs> okay. oh. So first off, we've I've got this little um, public service announcement that we do at the beginning of all these talks about checking your trees for the for um, this little insect that we have here. It's the ACP. It's the Asian citrus psyllid. And it transmits a disease called HLB, Wang Long Bing. Um, and it is a fatal disease and um, there is no cure. So um, we ask that you check your trees for this insect. This is a little guy, you might not see him. This is a big infestation right here. So, so that's what you might see if you have a big infestation. But mostly what you're going to look for is this little white curly stuff on the on the new soft foliage and um, where the new leaves are coming out. These are the little nymphs. They, they look like little Pikachus, <laughs> I guess you'd wanna call them. Um, if, you're, if your tree gets the disease, this is kind of what it's gonna look like. The leaves will be blotched. And now if this was a nutrient deficiency, you'd have the same thing going on both sides of this mid vein here. So it wouldn't be weird blotches all over. Don't freak out if you see blotches, turn the leaf over. It could be some kind of damage on the back of the leaf. Um, the fruits misshapen. Um, sometimes it doesn't even ripen all the way. It'll stay green like this. And look for ants because ants like to farm these guys for the honeydew. So they'll keep the, the good bugs away the predator bugs away from them. Um, so control your ants, look to see if your ants are going to a, a certain place and you might actually find these guys. Um, we're asking you to treat yourself. When this first came to the county, um, they were coming out and treating your trees, but there's been so many of them that we ask that you treat yourself. Um, if your tree gets the disease, um, it really needs to be removed. We've got an entire industry that's dependent on citrus and the, it's been, it's devastated Florida. So um, if we were doing this in person, here's the little card that we would give you. Um, it gives you all the information, information for homeowners. It gives you what you can do, what to look for, um, what kind of management you can do to your trees. There's also a link to maps, interactive map that's pretty cool. You can look up certain areas and see where the insect has been found. You can see where they've released predators um, and where the disease has been found. Um, this is kind of a cool picture of, these are the little nymphs that have been um, parasitoid, parasitized. Um, that the little holes in them mean that the um, little wasps that they released have done their job to kill them. And onto a pollinator garden. So why do I want a pollinator garden? Okay, so one third of all the food we eat depends on pollinators. Um, pollinators are important to ecosystems and animals and humans are indirectly dependent on the fruits or plants that pollinators help create. So consider the honeybee, I added a lot um, a lot more information here on honeybees because that's kind of what we think of when we think of pollinators. They're not the only ones, but they're, they're a major one in the area. So um, honeybees are truly social. They, um, they have cooperative group care, division of labor, um, and an overlap of generations. So they're a whole entire community in a hive. Um, they communicate. So <laughs> How did all these bees know to come to my hummingbird feeder? Well, they do something called the waggle dance and the round dance. And it's, to me, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> um, they, use, they use the dip, the sun and the flight path and the food patch, and then they go back to the, the honeycomb and they do a little dance. And as many times as they turn around or whatever, it tells the rest of the guys where to go. Um, if, <laughs> if you want science information on the, the waggle dance, here's a, a site here on the UC, UCR education has honeybee dance language site. 
So anyway, honeybees are dying at troubling rates. So reasons for their decline, habitat loss, mites, viruses, bacterial diseases, fungi, and pesticides. Um, annual losses. So here, Be Informed is an organization that tracks the losses of honeybees from managed hives. Um, and the latest information was 2019, 2020, but we've been hovering pretty much over 40% for quite a while. Um, so 40%, that's, that's huge. If you were, um, if that was your business and you were use, losing 40% of it all the time, you, you might give up. So the one thing that native bee numbers are in decline, mostly due to loss of habitat. Now this is um, Colorado. And when you think of Colorado, Rocky Mountain High, that this isn't the picture that John Denver kind of put in your brain. Um, tilling destroys native bee nests. A lot of bees nest, a lot of the native bees nest in the ground. And if you look around right now, they're really active. So how can I help? Okay, provide food, water, and shelter. Um, forage plants, okay, they provide better nutrition for the bees and it, better nutrition helps them better deal with disease and pesticides. Mm. Um, so now's a good time to look at some of our native bee pollinators. Um, some are really tiny, you probably might not even know that they're there. California has over 1600 native bee species. And that's more than anywhere. So for the native bees, they do not live in hives. 75% um, are solitary. Um, they're not in danger of colony collapse because um, colony collapse only affects honeybees in managed hives. Um, they do not pr produce harvestable honey and they, because they have no need to store honey. Um, this information down here is a little old, but it was the newest that I could find is that 35 to 38% of pollination services required by our crops in California are provided by native bees. So plants for bees, what do you wanna do for your plants? You wanna do these four things. You wanna mix plant families, flower sizes, flower shapes, and flower colors. So plant families. So some bees only go to certain plants and some bees will they'll just go anywhere. So you want to mix your plant families. Um, mix the flower sizes and shapes. So um, a bee's tongue is going to correspond to the, you, the length of the bee's tongue is going to correspond to the, the size of the flower that the bee goes to. So you want to mix a lot of different um, flower sizes and shapes. And planting groups. So bees like floral consistency. So you're, you want to plant in patches that are like a meter square. And that might be a lot. If you have like small plants, you might need half a dozen. Um, if you have, okay, so this is my Ceanothus concha. And this is what, you only need one of those. You know, and this isn't going to bloom all year round, but it's going to stay green. And I included this because, um, there's a lot of um, bee plants, the plants that the bees really like that are drought tolerant. This one happens to be um, drought tolerant. It doesn't like summer water at all. So that is perfect for us now. Once you establish this plant, um, you don't have to water it at all during the summer. If we're having a drought, you're gonna have to water it um, like in the fall and the winter a little bit when we would normally, when it would normally pick up water. But, a lot of these plants used to be um, used to be in the landscape a lot more, and a lot of the landscapers said, "Well, they're just not long lived." Well, they weren't long lived because we were watering them in the summer. Um, other plants, manzanitas, a good one for that. Um, woolly blue curls um, doesn't like summer water, so so check your check your plants. Um, like I said, that's the if it's going to be best for the, um, oh, I put this picture in here at trash day. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I should do another one. So anyway, <laughs> that's, that's all for that. 
So um, best colors for a bee garden. So bees see differently than we see. Okay, so our human vision is more in the red and orange where we don't go to ultraviolet where they do. So um, you're gonna pick plants in this color palette. They, they really like the purple ones, the purple ones and the blue ones. So pollen and nectar is needed year round. Um, pollen's important in the spring and nectar's important in the fall. Um, there's the Honey Bee Haven list from the Honey Bee Haven. I think it's at UC Davis. I'm not quite positive, but I think that's where the Honey Bee Haven is. And um, they have a list that will tell you which plants, a list of plants, and it tells you which ones support pollen and which ones support nectar and a lot of other information on them too. So plant for year round bloom. So when you've got one flower that's getting ready to fade, make sure that there's a replacement to take its place. If you've got um, a plant that's flowering and it's, it's dying out, and but this other one's gonna be ready in a week or two, the bees aren't gonna hang around. So you wanna overlap your, your bloom periods. And you can do that too with, um, with um, I have a little ground cover flower, a Santa, I think it's a Santa Barbara daisy. And what I do with that one is that I, I, when I cut it back, I cut it, half of them back at different times. So one of them is always blooming. And um, this is actually the Honey Bee Haven garden. Oh, it's at UC Davis. Okay, Plants of the Haven. And you see there's a lot of purples and blues in there. Um, UC Berkeley um, Urban Bee Lab also has best bee plants for California. Um, and here they're gonna, they give you a lot of information on if they're annuals, pollen or nectar, et cetera, et cetera. So for your bee habitats, you, you're gonna wanna provide water, um, a water source and note that they need to stand to drink. So putting water in a dish out there isn't gonna do any good if they don't have a place to land. And bare soil for ground nesting bees, which is a good thing for, you know, you can, you can have that ugly part in the back of your, in the back of your yard, just, just keep that, the, the part, you don't have to have plants on it every um, piece of soil that you have, you can, you can keep an ugly part in your garden. <laughs> so here is, um, this is a bird bath. And if you, if you listen, they're building, <laughs> the bees are building a house. Anyway, what I've done with this bird bath is um, I put rocks in it and these are sandstone rocks. So they kind of soak up the water too. So, and um, this one is ground nesting bees. And and they're kind of cool. And I wish I would have made that a longer video. <laughs> oh no. Okay, so habitats, bee houses for wood and cavity nesting bees. Okay, um, so they should, have holes that correspond to body size, which is you can drill different size holes in, in a piece of wood, 3 16 to 5 16 um, They will not use blocks that move or, or are open in the back. Um, fence posts work. Um, they need to have a shaded entrance. Um, wood is the preferred material, but be careful when you're working with wood because um, a couple of years ago, there was a box store that sold these really cute little um, bee houses, but it was made out of, they were made out of cedar and cedar's a wood that repels insects. So you, <laughs> you, want, you, you don't want to make a house that's going to repel them. Um, the entrance needs to be out of prevailing winds. You don't want the wind coming in your front door and pathogens can be a problem. So if you can't clean it, please replace it. Um, you can build these, um, there's two different kinds, nests for native bees and tunnel nests for bees. Um, the Xerxes Society has um, two, and, and you can just, you can put these into a search engine, you can Google these and it, it'll come out, these little pamphlets come out in PDF form. And this is cute. And this might work um, if you put it on top of a post, nailed it on a post, but it's hanging there, it's moving. They're never gonna use that. 
but that gives you kind of the idea of how to do it. Just drill holes in a piece of wood. So you can also create a damp salt lick and that works for butterflies and bees. So don't, don't use a dripping hose. <laughs> I need to take that out. Drip irrigation, the, the water company will come after you. Drip irrigation is fine or put a bird bath on bare soil, create a damp area and you can mix some salt or wood ashes into it to attract them for like the mineral stuff. And uh, if you're afraid of bees because they sting, I know a lot of my neighbors are afraid of the bees coming because they're gonna get stung. Um, just remember they're vegetarian wasps. They're defensive, they're not aggressive. Um, and, and native bees don't have a hive to, de hive to defend. Um, so if you're being harassed, look around for a hive nearby because that's when bees will get aggressive is when they're, when they're protecting the hive. Um, my neighbor had a beehive in their chimney and I couldn't go out in the backyard for an entire year <laughs> because yes, they were aggressive. And um, here's a couple pictures of hives. Here's the, the old um, scary, crazy dude hive in the old tree. And this one's, I think this one's just super, super cool. This is um, Kira, who's a, she's an elementary teacher and a, and a hiker. And she found this brand new hive. I mean, this is, this is, white wax this is just this is just being made right now so swarms um you may have run into swarms and they show up as clouds of bees and everybody gets crazy and runs in the house and rolls up the car doors but um they're less likely to attack because they're not protecting a hive. They're just looking for a new place to go and, and they can stay for a few hours or a few days. We get calls on um on swarms a lot and it's just sit it out for a couple days and um, they will probably leave. What they're looking for in your house is dark cavities with a four to nine gallon volume, preferably at least nine feet high. So be calm. <laughs> Um, it's and, and you know close off any entrances that you have. Like I said, the the um, the neighbors with it in in their house, their um, chimney was a perfect place for the bees to hive. So what about pesticides? Okay, the neonics. Um, these are all the neonics. These are the ones that are really bad for bees. Uh, so before you use anything, I encourage you to go to our IPM site, the UC Davis IPM site. So what you want to do, you're going to go to the home garden and turf. And in that, there's a pesticides and alternatives. And then you're going to want to go to the active ingredient database. Now, anything you buy is going to have an active ingredient on it. If it's even if it's just like a horticultural oil or a neem oil, or something like that, it, the stuff that the safer stuff, the organic stuff, it's gonna have an active ingredient. So you're gonna go to the database, you're gonna look up your active ingredient. And I use neem oil here because a lot of people, you know, it's organic, it's, it's great, it's, you know, safe for the environment, it's natural enemies, it's really good, very, very low. Um, to um, hazard to people and animals. But if you look, it's got a moderate rating for honeybees um, as opposed to this, um, <laughs> I'm not gonna pronounce that. That's a, that's a neonic. Um, as opposed to this one, honeybees, it's very high. So it gives you the listing there on, and what does moderate mean? And there's the impact to honeybees right here. And this is all the honeybee ratings. So um, the very high, like the neonix says, do not apply to blooming plants. The moderate, so that was the neem oil, apply only during late evening, night, or early morning because you don't want to use it when, when they are forward foraging. Okay, so basically the short story on a bee-friendly garden is that you want to choose a diversity of floral hosts. Um, <laughs> the, the designers hate me for this, but if you, because they'll say go with, you know, maybe four or five different plants for your design. If you have the room, 20 different types of plant, flowering plants is ideal. 
Okay, you probably don't have the room. Maybe you can work with some of your neighbors so you're not all planting the same thing at the same time. Um, overlap flowering times between seasons, design a garden with structure. The bees like that structure. Plant in the sun, they like to feed in the sun, plant in patches, we talked about the floral consistency. Um, seed annuals early to ensure development. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna, you usually don't think of planting um, annuals in, um, in fall, but that's a good time because it gives them time to be established. And, and if you, and it's not terrible if you plant them in the spring, but, but then you're gonna be feeding um, the birds a lot of expensive um, bird food. Um, flower maintenance, deadheading, that it's gonna give you more flowers. Um, water regularly. Um, we just don't let your plants get stressed. Um, water's a big issue right now. Uh, and no pesticides. And consider plant climate zones because just because you pick a California native plant doesn't mean that it's going to do good in your garden because we've got everything from, from the Sierras to the coast. So um, choose something that's going to do good in your region. And don't forget about nesting bees. Here's the, <laughs> that little messy part in the back of your yard. <laughs> so on to other bees that pollinate. Breezes, bugs, birds, beetles, bats, and butterflies. So butterflies, butterflies like inflorescence. So an inflorescence would be a flower with a lot of little flowers on it because they're, they're determined by wind, usually where they land. And, and they're not like a bee that can buzz around anywhere. When they land, they wanna, they wanna hit as many flowers as they can. Um, okay, so adult butterflies like plants from the daisy or mint families, um, flowers with short flower tubes, flat topped or clustered, like I said, um, red, orange, yellow, pink, or purple colored. And your moth pollinators are gonna usually pick white or dull flowers. Why? Because those show up at night better. So um, here for that, that little messy area in the back of your yard, these are um, plants that attract different butterflies. Um, the painted lady likes cheeseweed. Um, pigweed for the pygmy blues, that kind of makes sense, huh? <laughs> and um, wild mustard for the cabbage whites. So um, plants for butterflies, plant in full sun, butterflies feed in the sun. So your flowers should have sun from mid morning through mid afternoon. No insecticides. We talked about the, the BT or the, we talked about the, the neem oil and the neonics. Now these are BT is, um, it's also approved for, for, um, organic gardening, and um, it's lethal to caterpillars, any, any kind of caterpillars. So that's what butterflies come from. So you don't wanna use BT. And if you wanna grow butterflies, you need to feed caterpillars. And um, caterpillars are picky eaters. So once again, diversity, grow a wide variety of native plants for native butterflies. And the monarchs, um, you probably know by now that you want to pick the, to grow monarchs, you want to pick the native um, milkweed species. Um, but what we don't think about a lot is these guys migrate and they rely on late blooming plants like aster and goldenrod. Um, there's not a whole lot of plants that, flowers that bloom in the fall. So make sure that you pick flowers that bloom in the fall to um, sustain them on their journey. And um, butterflies fly in the day, moths fly at night. And um, fun fact, the yucca plant is dependent upon the yucca moth for its survival. So um, they depend on each other. So um, some moths are major agricultural pests, but others are important pollinators due to their hairy bodies. And I, I'm guessing they're hairy antenna too. Um, this one here, <laughs> this is, I, I, I love this guy. This is the bird poop moth. Um, mimicry at its finest. Um, if you look like that, nothing's gonna come and eat you. 
<laughs> um, this guy just shows that moss can be colorful. And um, to differentiate between a moth and a butterfly, um, butterflies always have the little knobs on the end of their antenna and moths do not. And moths usually rest with their wings down, except for this guy, and butterflies with their wings up. So your habitat for butterflies, they like to rest on rocks. Uh, they like to puddle in the mud. So we talked about a, the little mud puddle. Um, you can create a puddling station. Um, I like this especially because here they took an old pot and they just turned it upside down. They put the saucer on the top to make a puddling station. And to design a puddling station, it's really easy. All you need is a layer of sand. You add a layer of compost and place pebbles on top. And then you add water, but not so the pebbles are completely covered, just water up to the pebbles. And butterfly feeders. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> I always thought that these were just little garden designs. <laughs> so um, you can make butterfly food, which is, one part sugar and 18 parts water. Um, that's that's pretty crazy. Um, they will also consume sports drinks. So um, <laughs> you can put Gatorade out for them. Try and stay away from the from the like the Red Bull, the stuff with the caffeine. You don't want the caffeine. And um, change it. Put it in a in a shallow dish and change it every couple of days. And um, not all butterflies consume nectar. Some feed on tree sap, fermenting fruit, and animal manure. And I did not include a picture of the butterflies on the dog poop for you. You're welcome. Um, so you can do this uh, different ways. You can hang fruit here. Look at all the monarchs on these orange slices. You can hang fruit. You can put it in a dish. You can mush it. Um, and you can put um, sugar water on top of it to attract them. Okay, on to birds. So when pollination is carried out by birds, it's called ornithophily, and I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and hummingbirds are the most familiar ornithophilus. <laughs> so hummingbirds like large orange and red tubed flowers, and um, they lack a strong response to scent. So these flowers are usually odorless. Um, you can provide a hummingbird feeder that will add to their nectar resources. And for um, feeding them one part sugar to four parts water, white refined sugar only. Um, that's because it's, that's all it is is sugar. When you start getting into the different mixes and the naturals and the organics, it might have other stuff in it that you don't want in it. Just, just plain old white refined sugar. And um, food coloring is not necessary. Most of your feeders are gonna be red anyway, and that's gonna be enough to attract them. And less sugar is best. Um, it's, it, you're not gonna get them sick if you give them too much sugar, but, but you're better erring on the less sugar side. So it's important to keep your nectar safe. It can be kept in the refrigerator for a week, but once you put it in the, the um, feeder, it's gonna ferment in two to three days and drinking fermented nectar causes enlarged livers in these little birds. So only provide enough nectar to last two to three days. Um, clean it every time you fill it, clean it. Um, there's a lot of good ones out there that come apart that you can put in the dishwasher now. And um, once a week, clean it with a solution of one part vinegar to four parts of water and then <laughs> rinse it with warm water three times. <laughs> and I don't know where they came up with three times, but that's what they say. So rinse it three times before refilling. And if they're dirty, you can add... Um, if, you, if it's not something you can get the brush into, you can add um, uh, dry rice to it and kind of shake it around and it'll clean it out. And um, oh, the helpful hint here is that uh, you can purchase disposable mascara brushes online in bulk and they're really cheap and they do a really good job of cleaning the feeder ports. And they're not like the really expensive ones that you get at the, if you, um, shop the supply stores. 
So they also depend on insects as a protein source. Um, and especially this time of year when they have, um, when they have the little, little fledglings in the nest. So um, try and invite tiny insects for the tiny birds. These are a few things that you can do. I realized that um, this is the, oh, there's some butterflies on the fruit. Um, I realized this when I saw my hummingbirds hanging out by the composter, you know, what was going on. Um, I have, a, I'm a terrible composter and I always have a lot of fruit flies. So I, I prop the door open for a couple hours, you know, during the day to let the hummingbirds have some fruit flies. Um, water's not important in, a, in the sense that they do get water from, from the nectar, but um, they do get sticky and they do like to clean. So on to beetles and bugs as beneficial pollinators. So these pictures, this guy's the, the ladybug and you see the ladybug munching on the aphids. Here's a ladybug um, with her eggs. So um, if you see that on the underside of your leaf, don't, leaves, don't wipe them off. Those are little eggs. And this guy who looks like a prehistoric bug that you might not like in your house is actually the immature ladybug. So, so don't get rid of that guy either. And, and beetles are the largest group of pollinators and only because there's so many of them. And some are not so beneficial. <laughs> and um, if you have white roses, you've probably had this guy and, and know that the, um, the lizards like those. <laughs> so if you can shake them off, you can feed them to the lizards. <laughs> so bats. Bats consume millions of insects each night. They don't get caught in people's hair. They don't suck on human blood. And over 300 species of fruit and agave depend on bats for pollination. If we didn't have bats, we wouldn't have tequila. So it's like a whole big circle of life here. Um, bat boxes. Um, there were fires a while ago in um, Camarillo and the bats were burned out of the caves up there. Um, so you, you can supply bat boxes for them. Uh, people realized that all of a sudden they were trying to get into their attics and stuff like that. Um, so you can, um, they, it needs to be warm. So you're gonna wanna put that box on the south side. It's gonna have to be in a sunny location and it needs to be 15 to 20 feet above the ground. And that's because they need at least 10 feet when they come out at night. And um, <laughs> if they're gonna hit the ground, they're not gonna nest in the bat boxes. And you can find, um, you can find bat boxes online. You can, um, you can purchase them or there's directions for making the bat boxes. <gasps> and if you're still afraid of bats, if you take a picture of them and turn it upside down, they're, they're just disco partying guys. Oh no. Okay, so the importance of balance, it's look to nature is what you wanna do when you're creating your pollinator garden. You wanna look to nature. Um, taller plants in back and the shorter plants in front. And um, why? Well, the, the bees like it that way. And also you can see them. So, um, wow, this went faster than I thought. Okay, so just one more thing. This was something that I added at the, at the end because right now with the, with the drought and planting, you wanna make sure you plant for success. You don't wanna wait, you don't wanna use your water and purchase your plants and then end up losing them. So for planting for success, Remove your plant from the pot and run your finger down the side. You don't have to do like my kid does and tear the roots apart, but just breaking those little tiny um, roots on the side will help them grow out into the surrounding soil. Um, make sure that your plant sits on firm soil in the hole. You don't want it to sink down. You wanna plant a little high. You wanna backfill with native soil so that Soil that you dug out of the hole, you're gonna put that back in after you put the plant in. Um, do not add amendments. Okay, you want, it, you want the roots to grow into the native soil, so you don't wanna put a, a fluffy layer between them. It's not gonna help. 
Um, do not add fertilizer. Um, if you've got natives, they don't like fertilizer. If you've got like Mediterranean plants that are the drought tolerant plants, um, there's a lot of um, good pollinator plants that, that aren't natives, which I say go with the natives, but there's a lot of nice plants that aren't natives. When you buy those at the nursery, they've usually added so much fertilizer in them. And this doesn't count for vegetables, but just, just your ornamental plants that you probably won't have to fertilize those for at least a year. Um, vitamins or magic growing compounds, B12. <laughs> Is that the one that the B vitamins that they, they say for um, transplant chalk? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's just a misnomer. Um, plants do not take up vitamins. Okay. The nutrients that they take up, or you've got micronutrients and, um, okay, help me with this. The micronutrients and the, <laughs> anyway, you've got- NPK. <laughs> yeah, that, those, are the, those are the macro and the micronutrients, okay? You've got the nutrients that the plants take up, but plants don't take up vitamins. And that's something that they still sell at the store and it's still not gonna do anything for your plants. Don't waste your money. Um, okay, so you're going to want to construct a water basin from the remaining soil that's the same diameter as the root ball. So this is a pepper plant. This was the closest I could get to showing you how to do it. But you're going to water directly on where that plant was, the root ball. Um, we get calls a lot from people that say things like, well, I planted it, I water it every other day and they still died. Well, if you're watering outside of this area here, the root ball, it, water doesn't go from one soil into another soil until the first soil is completely saturated. So you're, you're watering this, but it's not going into that. And um, the, little, the little well that you made here is the runoff water is gonna go down and it's gonna go into the native soil. And that's when your plants are established is when the roots finally go into the native soil. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to include this one in every one of my talks because <laughs> I have a protect our wildlife um, sign out in front of my house. And, and I came out one morning and this rabbit was, um, <laughs> was sitting there reading the sign. Um, also, this is, a, this, is a, this is a cool plant. If you can get your hands on a, on a um, conejo buckwheat, which is um, native to the conejo, if you can get your hands on a conejo buckwheat, it's a perfect plant for um, butterflies and, um, and bees, not as much as butterflies, but it does really good in drought conditions. And it also does not like summer water. So this is, um, this is my water wise meadow area in my front yard. So you can do it and it, it does, this is what it looks like in spring. <laughs> It's not going to look like this in the middle of the summer, but you know, you can get rid of your grass, you can create a pollinator garden, and um, it's, it's not going to cost you all of your, your water allotment that they're going to give you. And um, problems or questions, um, you can always contact us at the Master Gardener Helpline. Um, no phone calls yet. Hopefully soon we'll be back in the office taking phone calls, but we're still in COVID protocol. Um, you can send us an email and you can send us pictures. If you have a problem with something, say it's a, um, a leaf problem, show us a close up of the leaf, show us a far away of the entire plant, and then maybe a picture of the ground surrounding it. Um, we like pictures. The more pictures helps us to ID any problems. And here are our UC sites. Um, there's a how to reduce bee poisoning from pesticides. Um, I can't recommend this book enough. The California Bees and Blooms is a, is a great book. Um, I got a lot of my information out of that. And my bee resources. <laughs> so. If you can get a copy of this, I, this would be a handout if we were in person. Um, Big picture. Yeah. Okay. So UC Davis has a, has a great site, a bee garden site. 
And within that site, I put this here, they have resources and they actually have a list of, um, of plants that for um, water wise plants for making your pollinator garden, which is a really good idea right now. And what else do we have here? Oh, pollination, if you have kids, that's a really good site to go to. That's a fun one. And the Honey Bee Haven plant list. Um, that one you can um, get from the Honey Bee Haven site. And um, they have the list. They have a list of natives and they have a list of all the plants too. And, um, oh, you can build a bee house. And that is basically it. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Um, please put them in the chat box if you do. I guess you were very, very thorough. I guess yeah. I answered everything, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, okay, if well. there are no questions, we are finished for the night. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming to this uh, Zoom. Thank you, Danny, and um, look forward to seeing you in another Zoom or in person. <laughs>